Before starting this YouTube channel, I bought my first DSLR camera. After I filmed the first episode, I tackled a bit with the picture mode, shooting all pictures in raw mode. While I was learning how to take sharp photos and create good composition, I wondered what is actually inside the raw file. Why it's considered the best solution when it comes to producing high quality images. Do you ever wonder how a DSLR camera can do this? I did some research about this topic. It turns out the process is a bit complicated, so fasten your seatbelts because this video will contain a lot of information to digest. What is the RAW format in digital photography? Well, let's see what Wikipedia tells us. A camera RAW image file contains minimally processed data from the image sensor of either a digital camera, a motion picture film scanner or other image scanner. Inside my digital SLR, I have an image sensor whose primary job is to capture as much light as it can in order to produce the final output image. RAW files are named so because they are not yet processed and therefore are not ready to be printed or edited with a bitmap graphics editor. Normally the image is processed by a RAW converter in a wide gamut internal color space where precise adjustments can be made before conversion to a positive file format such as TIFF or JPEG for storage, printing or further manipulation. So it seems that RAW files are considered the equivalent of film negative. I've heard about JPEG's files but what are TIFFs? Well I will explain this a bit later in the video. The definition continues with this often encodes the image in a device-dependent color space. There are dozens, if not hundreds of RAW formats in use by different models of digital equipment, like cameras or film scanners. My camera is made by Canon, so this means that I should look at these three main formats, CRW, CR2, CR3. Let's try and take a picture in RAW mode and see what the camera gives us. I took a picture of my Chinese Arduino Uno. It looks like a standard image. The immediate difference is that it has the CR2 extension. The CR2 stands for Camera RAW 2. As far as I understood, the CR2 can be described as follows. It basically boils down to this sentence. CR2 is just a modified TIFF file. Aside from storing the TIFF header and the TIFF EFIDs, the format pays little attention to the requirements of the TIFF specifications. Well, for starters, TIFF is just another image file format that can store all the original information using a loosely compression technique, meaning that the compression algorithm does not alter the original data. This means that you have one-to-one -one relation, before and after compression. As a side note, JPEG stores all colors as RGB and TIFF stores them using the CMYK color space. Historically, TIFF was used more for press. We can conclude that the CR2 file format contains a small piece of TIFF with other custom camera raw fields that Canon added on top. Let's then inspect the file using the hex dump utility. The result is approximately 28 megs of data. That's quite large for a single image file. Let's dump the first 5000 bytes. Well, it does not look like this is readable from a human perspective. Let's try using strings. We can see that there are certain key strings that are familiar to us like Canon ATD or, or some XML-like format structure which is actually an XMP. Not surprisingly that Canon stores a lot of metadata information in the file. Let's see if we can find some more information about the file because I'm not gonna reverse engineer every bit. Not because I wouldn't, but because it will take a lot of time figuring it by myself. We can use the exit tool to print out all the metadata tags, key value pairs of the CR2 image. Wow, I'm impressed. There's a lot of information that the camera stores per photo. The nice thing is that you can use Exif tool to add yourself extra metadata information to the file or to extract the thumbnail of the image. Let's further search Google, maybe we can find something useful to let us have a more deep insight about this. I found a couple of links and PDFs that could help us. Looks like someone already reverse engineered this and did a lot of research on the subject and document everything found here. We now have something to help us understand more but I generally prefer this diagram because it explains every part of the file more clearly than this text document. I want to say thanks to this guy for creating this diagram documentation and making this publicly available. Also he was nice to let me show his work on this video so follow this awesome guy on Twitter. Let's deep dive into the format. To do this I wrote a simple C command line program that parses the TIFF, CR2 header and all the four if IDs. Let's look at this diagram. We see that CR2 file is composed of three sections. One section stores all the file headers which are the TIFF header and the CR2 header. The second big section is the image file directories, shorthand EFITs. We have four of them in total. Every one of them contains information alongside with the starting address of the next one, much like a linked list. We have the images data where we can see that the CR2 is composed of four images of the original image in different sizes. At the start of the file, the first eight bytes contains the TIFF header which this is composed by three fields. The endiness which can be MM that stands for the Big Indian or II which means Little Indian, I, Intel, M, Motorola. 
Then we have a magical number, which is 2 byte long and a 4 byte value, which holds the value offset to the first information file directory. Then we have the next header, which is the CR2 header that starts from the offset age right after the TIFF header. The header consists of three fields. First is the Canon RAW Maker, 2 bytes, usually CR. Then the version of the format 2 bytes, in our case the value 2, and a 4 byte value, meaning the offset of the raw image file directory. This seems to point to the information file directory 3. We can also see that certain EFID entries are pointed to subsections. The two subsections are called EXIF and Maker Notes. The EFID 0 contains the address of the EXIF section, and the EXIF section contains the address of the Maker Notes. EXIF stands for Exchangeable Image File Format, which is the format to store camera tags such as date and time, copyright information, and can even store data like, for example, a thumbnail of an image. The Maker Notes section stores tags exactly like in the EXIF section. The difference is that tags are defined by the manufacturer. The manufacturer can write anything that he pleases. This is why Maker Notes are not defined in a unified specification and had to be reverse engineered. Manufacturers don't want us to tinker with the data. I don't know why. There are four more sections which stores the image data. The first three image sections are basically the image, but smaller, compressed and uncompressed, and the fourth and the final section contains the raw image data in its full size, loosely compressed in JPEG, but it does not contain actual RGB data. I will not cover this section in this video further. I will maybe explain this in another episode or let this be an exercise to the viewer. To cut this short, these sections are compressed using different techniques and in order to produce the final resulting image, you need to take the last section and apply a demon sizing algorithm to compute the desired RGB data. In order to fully understand this even more, I wrote a simple command line utility to dump the headers and the EFID sections in standard output. Let me explain the code. We have the main function that extracts the image file path from the array of arguments. Then we open the file in read mode. We output file size information in megabytes and the file path. Then we create an automatic storage duration variable of type tiff underscore header. Struct tiff underscore header consists of these three fields that I mentioned earlier. The only thing remaining is that we should tell GCC to not add padding to struct. This construct is compiler dependent, but I think other compilers have something similar in order to do this. I don't want to make the code be compatible with other compilers, so we will keep using this. Down at line 21, we use a static assert which verifies at compile time that the struct actually occupies 8 bytes and nothing more. At the line 13, we pass the address of the struct and tell F3 that we want to read one block of size of struct tiff header from the CR which is the file pointer. Then we dump the contents of the tiff header we just parsed to the standard output. We then print a nicely friendly message to let the user know what type of endiness we're dealing with. We're doing the same thing with the CR2 header. We declare an automatic storage duration variable, we pass the pointer, read from the file pointer and dump the contents that are saved to the pointer to standard output. Let's print out the first lines of the output. Wow, this wasn't that hard, right? Let's look back at the diagram. So we have parsed the headers, now let's parse the 4 FIDs. This should be the same, right? Yeah, but this time we have a lot more information to parse than 4 6 bytes. Looks like every EFID points to the next one like a linked list and the value of the next EFID is stored in the last field. The thing is that EFID 0 has these two sub EFIDs where we find the EXIF information and the make a note section. Because we have 4 EFIDs, let's declare an array of 4 structs EFIDs. The EFID structs holds the number of entries, an array of entries and the address of the next EFID in the CR2 file. We parse together our 4 EFIDs iterating each element in the array and pass the address of every element to the EFID parse function, which basically does parse the entries of the given EFID. Then after the EFID is parsed, we assign the next offset of the file to parse from there the next EFID. The array of entries are created by using malloc, so we should take care of freeing the memory at the end of the program. Then like what we did with the two headers, we dump the information to standard output. The tricky thing is that it's not that simple now to dump the information to standard output because every entry can hold variable type data. Let's look how I define an entry. An entry consists of the tag ID. Every entry has a sign, an ID which identifies what kind of tag we're dealing with. A couple of examples tags are defined like this. The tag type which stores the type of data we're dealing with. I define here an enum holding all possible tag types that can occur in the file alongside with helpful functions. Then we have the number of value, which is an interesting field because as far as I understand, here should be stored how many items of the preceding type we have at the starting address stored in the next field called value. If the number of value is 1, then this means that the value is not an address, but the actual value which cannot be more than 32 bits. This information is crucial because without this, we cannot interpret the following data found in each EFID entry correctly and write to standard out. So without further ado, when we dump every entry, we make sure to call the conversion function which converts the data stored at the address value in a human readable format. I declared an array of tag type tables struct to help me pick the right conversion functions for the appropriate tag type we're dealing with. 
So if we look closely, we pass the t in the function tag type conf that by indexing it, it will give us a function pointer which then we can use to call it by. Passing the file pointer, the address slash value and the count. Every function does this exact thing of picking at the address given in the file and interpret the bytes given the tag type. Because I'm lazy and I do not want to copy and paste all the code and switch types and formats, I instead created a compile time macro to generate all my functions for every type. We have two of these because there are certain types which use a slightly more complicated memory layout format and we cannot use the same conversion macro above. This happens when we are dealing with rational data. Rational data can be signed and unsigned and I declared here two structs for these types. When this is compiled, we have all the functions generated and we pass every one of these as the third parameter in our static table array. Now we have all the unmarshalling process down. We can generate every byte payload to be printed, alongside with other fields of an entry at line 55. If we compile and run, we have a lot of data. Look for example at the EFID 0, we have our canon string found in the strings command output. And of course this is a string with an ending 0. It looks like we're doing what exif tool is doing but more low level and verbose. To conclude this, we achieve a more deeper understanding of the CI2 format. We know that the canon stores a lot of interesting metadata information that we can use in our programs to filter out or to further analyze an image in what scenarios were done and when the photo was taken and so forth. We now know that the CR2 file stores three different images of different sizes beside the thumbnail and the full image is not stored directly as an RGB image. The CR2 file is inspired by the TIFF format but does not give a damn about it, introducing its own specific ins and outs that the manufacturer wants. JPEG uses a loosey form of compression, so meaning that an amount of bytes of the original image is lost and cannot be restored due to compression. On the other hand, the raw files capture all the information from the sensor and does not alter it. Given an advanced demo sizing technique, we can create our own JPEGs that can save certain features of the image we're interested to display. From the start, JPEG looks like it's not a flexible flat file because we lose further information by editing it, so we are quickly left with a degrading image. Raw files, on the other hand, gives us a lot of control on how to apply demo sizing techniques to produce the best quality image you can, or at least the image that you're happy with. Photography is a subjective field and certain images for you could look better than others, but this does not mean you cannot improve your photographic and post-processing techniques even further to eventually create consistent images based on your own style of editing. Thanks again for taking time and for watching this episode. I went through a lot of details and I hope you're not fully asleep by now. See you in the next video. Bye.